Have you ever wondered why we have seven days in a week rather than maybe 10 or nine or five? And you might have already read up on the history of where the days of the week came from, but I'm gonna guess that you have never heard this before because I honestly think that they're not exactly telling you the entire story of where our seven days in the week came from and how they truly got their names originally. Because I think this will actually explain it in great detail. Something I sort of found out today, discovered when I was doing research. Of course, this is a common thing told to us here as to where the days of the week come from. And obviously they're, they're based on luminaries in the sky. And of course also Roman deities and before that Greek deities because they actually worship the host of heaven. You have Monday, which is Moon Day, obviously. Tuesday, which is Mars. Wednesday, Mercury. Thursday, Jupiter. Friday, Venus. Saturday, Saturn. Sunday, Sun. Now, of course, you've probably already heard of some of these before. And also, if you go through the, the, the names of the months, you find out that they're named after Roman gods, except for July and August, which July is named after Julius Caesar and August after Caesar Augustus. So you see, you know, if you look into it a little bit more, you find out that they usually have the same correlating gods depending on what culture is using the labels for each day. So you have to ask yourself, why are these days named after gods? I always thought that kind of be curious, right? Why would they name it after gods? Now, in the German Germanic adaptations, you have Sun's Day, Dia Solis, and of course Monday, which is named after Manny, the Norse personification of the moon. And Tuesday, which is named after Tyr, or Tyr, a one-handed Norse god of dueling. He is equated with Mars. So you see every culture tries to equate it to the same gods or, or related gods within their pantheon. In reality, they're all based off the mystery religions, and they are, in, in essence, the same god. You have Woden, or Odin, it's a ruler of the Norse, Norse gods' uh, realm, uh, with wisdom, magic, victory, and death. The Romans connected Woden uh, to Mercury, uh, because there were both guides of souls after death. Of course, Thursday is Thor's day. <laughs> Which is the Roman god Jupiter? Uh, it's equated to the Roman god Jupiter, and of course you got Frigg or Freya, uh, the Germanic god, as related to the Roman goddess Venus, for Friday. And of course Saturday is Saturn. It doesn't have uh, in the Germanic or Norse traditions any other gods named for this one. Uh, but it comes from Saturn's day. This is where it originated with Rome. And of course, the Greeks, you also have the same pantheon connection with each of the days. And I found it to be very curious, you know, because we have, if you look into sort of what they label as the history, they, they tell you that it came from the Babylonians, from the Sumerians, which is essentially the Tower of Babel from that time frame. And they claim that this is the most ancient of writings, and, th and this is the origination of these days. But actually, that's not the case, because uh, there were books before the Sumerian text. Uh, you also have, like, the Book of Noah, which we only have fragments of, but you can see correlations uh, with the Sumerian text. Okay, and actually the Book of Noah is before the Sumerian text text. And you also have uh, the Book of Enoch, which is a pseudographial text, which is from the time before the Sumerian text as well. But they try to they claim that the Sumerian text is the oldest because they can't confirm that the Book of Noah or the Book of Enoch is 100% the one that was, you know, the, the original Book of Noah or the original Book of Enoch. And it's very interesting because then they put the date and this is, this is a lot of these are secular historians that have their own lens, which they, they uh, interpret history through. Because, of course, they don't believe 
the Bible. And it's very interesting, though, because with the book, you know, if you actually look at some of these hierocritics writings, they actually are onto something and they don't even realize it. It's very interesting because they'll tell you that there's multiple writers in Genesis. And they're like, well, obviously Moses didn't write all this because there's different writers. And they, and they are able to identify that there's separate writers within Genesis and Exodus. And it makes perfect sense when you start really looking around at some of these ancient pseudobiographical texts like the Book of Enoch, the Life of Adam and Eve, uh, the Book of Jasher, Genesis Apocrypha. And if you start looking at all these other writings, you start to notice like verbatim lines in these books are also in Genesis. Like in the Book of Jubilees, you'll find the exact same lines as you see in Genesis, except for there's even a few additional lines, which makes it very clear that Moses referred to the book of Jubilees when he wrote Genesis. So what you start to realize, it starts to formate, is that Moses actually took a bunch of ancient writings and basically took pieces of it and put it in the in what we call the Pentateuch, or the first five books of Moses. So Moses didn't actually write what's there. He's actually cutting out pieces from more ancient texts and putting it in Genesis and Exodus such as the book of Noah and other writings. Of course, they had many writings that we don't have available today. Okay, and why am I getting into this? You'd be like, what does this have to do with the days of the week, right? Well, if you look at, uh, if you look at what the Hebrews saw the first seven days as being, it, at first it looks like it, it has no correlation at all. You're like, how does this have any relation? But then I'm going to show you what it is. Let me show you real quick here. The seven days of the week and the meanings of the days. Of course, I was telling you about how they claimed the Babylonians were the first ones. And then they try to claim that they formated the, the seven-day week off various phases of the moon, right? So, somehow they just came to the conclusion they must have formated the week off this. And of course, they claim it's the Babylonians, the Sumerians, because this is as far back as we have. Allegedly, right? But, and if you look into it, you start to notice all these different gods are correlating gods from different cultures, which, of course, if you look at the Tower of Babel, what happened there? They had been worshipping certain gods, and then the language was confused, and they all separated and went their own way with the same gods. So these same gods would end up with different names. And this is how we see all these different cultures with the same gods with different names yet they have the same names attributed to every single one of these days seven days and with hebrews if you look at the uh, book of genesis and you look at the breakdown of each of the seven days it just literally says day one day two day three day four and if you just look into it into the ancient greek it's literally that it has no meaning to it at all. It just literally is day one day. And it sounds very bland and as if it means nothing, but I'm going to show you how it means something. It's very interesting, actually. So you have here, here's, for example, uh, the first day of the week, which is Rishon in Hebrew, which means former first chief. Okay, and then if you go to the second day of the week, it's Sheni. Okay. And with this one, it just simply means second, or again, or another. And then the third day, which simply means third, and so on, right? But except for the last day. The last day is Sabbath, which means rest. Okay? Now, here's the connection. Now, this, is, this is based on a lot of studies of my own. Uh, it mentions in Scripture that there are seven spirits of God before his throne. It says it actually in a few places. It says it, and I'll, I'll use Wikipedia to show it to you really quickly so you get an idea. There's various biblical references to the seven spirits of God. You have Revelation 1-4, Revelation 3-1, Revelation 4-5, Revelation 5-6. And you also have Isaiah 11-2-3 which tells you about the seven spirits. It tells you what each one of them is. 
You have the spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom. You have the spirit of understanding. You have the spirit of counsel or might. You have the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of fear of the Lord. And these, and here represent the seven spirits which are before the throne of God. And you notice, you're starting to notice a correlation, okay? And I'm going to point this out. First, I have just have to simply explain what's going on here, and then I'll sort of back up what I'm saying. The reason why no names are given to the first six days, and only the last day is given a name, is because if you understand the principle of, of the Spirit, the Spirit is something invisible. It's hidden. It's something you can't see. So what we have here in the structure in the sort of the higher meanings of structure within scripture is you have the father the son and you have the mother or the spirit and the whole idea is that you have the family structure and there's some references to uh, the feminine being tied to the spirit which is something invisible. And you see this also in, in, in creation. You had Adam and Eve, right? And Eve was taken from the side of Adam. She was taken from internally in the side of Adam. She was hidden inside of Adam. So she's something that's not seen. And of course, you also see this in the New Testament in some scriptures, which a lot of people that are atheists take out of context and think it means something completely different. Um, it says about the woman being silent in church. And in reality... If you understand the context of what's being said, it was actually referring to this false Gnostic concept of the woman being in charge, sort of like you see with feminism, where the woman is telling everyone what to do. And Paul says this is wrong, that the woman is hidden. She's not boisterous. She's not you know, out there pretending to be a man, for example, like in feminism. we see, Essentially, feminism is the antithesis of the Holy Spirit of the, the concept of what the woman's supposed to be. The woman's supposed to be hidden. Okay. She's supposed to be meek or quiet, not, not boisterous, trying to take control of everything. This kind of thing. This is kind of the idea. And I think what we have going on here with the days of the week is the first six days are hidden. You don't know their names, but the seventh day is the day of rest or peace. It's the day of refreshment. And, you, and you, if you look through scripture, it talks about how uh, the Holy Spirit is a fountain. Okay, it says uh, Jesus talks to the woman at the well, saying that he'll give her water that is eternal, that she'll never have to take another drink of any water. And she's like, well, I want this water. And the water he was referring to is the Holy Spirit, uh, which refreshes you and, and fills you. Okay. And it also talks about women in Proverbs as being a fountain as well unto a man. So the Holy Spirit is a fountain unto people, and the woman is a fountain unto man. So that's sort of a correlation between woman and spirit as well. Now you have this day of rest, Sabbath. See, the, the Spirit of God is, is where you have rest, uh, the presence of God. It says, Be ye not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit gives you that peace, gives you that rest, which you're trying to seek and find in things like drugs and alcohol and things of that nature. Uh, so what I think is really going on here is the seven days of the week, they're hidden. And this is the concept of the spirit. The spirit is hidden. But each one of them represented the seven spirits of God. And as I indicated in Isaiah 11, 2 to 3, it tells you each of the spirits have a different function. Wisdom, the spirit of the Lord, spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, of might, spirit of knowledge, spirit of the fear of the Lord or respect of the Lord. So what we have here is each one has a different function. And you'll note when you look at the meanings today, these false gods that are attributed to the days of the week, they also have their own function. Okay, if you look down here, it talks about how each of these gods have a different personification. Okay, like for instance, Wednesday, which is Odin's day, has to be associated with wisdom, magic, and victory. You see that? And then you have Thor's day, which is the, the god of thunder, strength, and protection, right? These are perversions of the seven spirits of God. 
as I just mentioned, uh, I'm getting all, if you go over here, you'll see that there is actually a spirit of wisdom in the Holy Spirit. There's a spirit of understanding in the Holy Spirit. There's a spirit of counsel and a spirit of might or power. And you'll see that they've perverted it by putting false gods on each of these days and then giving them, ascribing to them various powers for each of the different gods. So it's literally a replacement for each of the Holy Spirit. There's seven spirits of God, and these are the pagan anti-God anti replacements that the devil put in place for everybody to worship instead, the host of heaven. So actually, I think the first seven days of God were originally named after the seven spirits of God. And because it's, it's a feminine understanding, it's hidden. And that's why it was literally not named when it was written in Scripture. It was just day one, day two, day three, except for the last day, which gives sort of an indication, a hint. The Sabbath is a day of rest, which the Holy Spirit is the water, the, the fountain that gives us rest, right? So, and you can see how this correlation could be accurate, is that we have seven days in the week. You have seven spirits before God's throne. We have what they are. Again, I said in Isaiah, each one has a different function. And you see how these pagan deities also have their own separate functions for each day. So they're literally trying to replace the Holy Spirit with these pagan angel, fallen angels, is what I'm thinking. Basically, these are fallen angels trying to take the place of the Holy Spirit on these days of the week. This is this is how I say or the Spirit of God. Um, so at any rate, this is sort of my little thoughts on this topic. Now, of course, a lot of Christians, they get hung up on this whole idea of the Holy Spirit being a feminine instead of a man. Of course, they th you, know, you have to ask yourself, and, and I'm going to cover this real quick because a lot of Christians uh, maybe are unaware of certain verses that make it very clear that one of the, one of the uh, a persons of the Godhead is feminine. If you look at Proverbs 1, if you look at Proverbs 1 and Proverbs 8, you will see that one of the Godhead is clearly a woman because it says it. And what a lot of theologians do with these verses is they claim it's Jesus that's the female being discussed. Okay, now you have to ask yourself, does that make any sense? Is Jesus a female? I don't think so. But if you look at these verses, any theologian you ask that has any credibility, they'll tell you, that this wisdom being discussed in Proverbs 1 and 8 is indeed God because of what's claimed wisdom is in the verses. Okay, it talks about wisdom being there at, before creation. Uh, and I can't recall what, what verse it was. Let me see if I can find it here. I don't know if it was on this one. I think it might have been Proverbs 8. Let me go find it real quick. And I can show you what I'm talking about. I, I, before. Okay, here we go. I believe this is it here. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting. From the beginning of ever the earth was. When Where there were no depths, I was brought forth. Where there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set the compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave his sea his degree, decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth. Then I was by him, as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of the, his earth. And my delights were with the sons of men. Now, therefore, hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are ye that keep my ways. Hear my instruction, be wise, and refuse it not. Blessed is the man that heareth me, walking daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. It talks about her being wisdom. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places, by the way the places of the path. She crieth at the gates. Now, this is what it says. So it says, this person is there before the works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning of ever the earth was. 
When there were no depths, I was brought forth. Now, what is that referring to? I'll show you what it's referring to. It's actually in Genesis 1. These scriptures are referring to Genesis 1. Let me show you. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So darkness was on the face of the deep. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning of ever the earth was. When there were no depths on the face of the deep, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. It says here, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So this is clearly ascribing the Spirit of God as being this wisdom, and this wisdom is said to be a she. Okay? So this is, and this is not the only thing. I mean, there's a lot more to this. I could go on and on proving this, but... Uh, the fact is that the Hebrew term for spirit in Hebrew is a f feminine term. Um, there is no declaration that the Holy Spirit is a male anywhere in Scripture. It's a, it's, and it, it, another thing is when you translate it from Hebrew and Greek to English, there's a lot lost in the process, especially if you have fallen man trying to translate the Scriptures into English. Um, so Jesus said, beware of the scribes. And the Pharisees, scribes, actually translate the scriptures from one language to another. Okay, so Jesus even tells us to beware of those who translate the scriptures because they can make mistakes. Um, the original languages do not have mistakes in them. That's the point. And so the point is, is that if the Holy Spirit is really a female or feminine, then it makes a lot of sense. The family structure, you have a father, you have a mother, you have a son. That's where we get the family structure from. And then you have mind, body, spirit, God the Father being the mind, Jesus being the flesh or the body, and the Holy Spirit being the spirit. And then everything starts to really fall into place. Things make a lot more sense. And this whole concept of the days of the week also makes sense because there's seven spirits before God's throne. And again, like I could go through and show you how woman is actually made in the image of the Holy Spirit. Man is made in the image of the Father. Children are made in the image of the Son. That's why Jesus said, you must be like a child to enter the kingdom of heaven because uh, the church is a child. Okay. The church is not an, a full grown adult until it's at the marriage supper of the lamb. And who is the, who is the, the church being married to Jesus? So Jesus is marrying a female, the church, the church right now is young. The church is ascribed the, the gender of a female. See what I mean? So, this all falls into place and makes sense if you really start to do a lot of digging and, and studying on this. I've done numerous videos talking about this in the past, showing like multiple correlations with all this. The Holy Spirit's a fountain. A woman is a fountain unto her husband. It says the Holy Spirit is a comforter or helper unto man. And it says that a woman is a helper for man. That's how she was created according to Scripture. It says she was a helpmate in Genesis uh uh, let's see, I think it's Genesis 2, right? Let me go find it here. Yep, here we go. Genesis 2, verse 20. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, fowl of the air, and every beast of the field. But for the Adam, there was not found a help meet for him or a helper. Okay? And... This is when God caused a great sleep upon Adam. He slept and he took one of his ribs. It doesn't actually literally say rib. It just says something from inside him and took it out. And this rib that was taken from man made he women and brought her unto man. So she was taken from within him. So she was hidden within him. You see what I mean? So all this stuff correlates on a higher level meaning. I'm not, am I saying that... Uh, that, that it's it's more than just a higher level meaning. No, I'm not. It, you know, sort of my point is that um, I, I just wanted to kind of point out that everyone assumes God is a he, but it says man and woman both are made in God's image. And a lot of people miss this. It actually says this. Um, male and female. Let's see if I can find I think it's Genesis 1. Let me... Yeah, let's see here if I can get it open. Yeah, here we go. 
here's the verse that says that both male and female are made in God's image. Okay, now if you have to just ask yourself a question. Let me read this first and I'll, I'll ask you the question. So God created man in his own image. Image of God created he, him. Male and female created he, them. So if male and female are made in God's image, then God obviously has some sort of feminine side or she wouldn't be made in his image, right? And this is and this is this is really where some of the church went off track because those that denied that there was any feminine aspect within God were the ones that also started looking at women as being the devil or the devilish creation or the temptress because um, I mean like for example Saint Jerome who translated the Latin Vulgate one of his famous quotes was that women are the root of all evil. I mean, they started looking at women as being evil in of themselves, that they're temptress, that they're they're not made in God's image because they started perverting what the scripture says. The scripture says that woman's made in God's image as well. So they started looking at women in a, in a very negative light. And, and I think this is kind of why they tried to get away from it. They tried to get away from this idea of there being any feminine aspect of God. God is all male, you know, and... Uh, and then this is why they try to explain away Proverbs 1 and 8 as well. Proverbs 1 and 8 make it very clear that there's a female uh, that's that's God. And a lot of them would just say it's Jesus, but clearly Jesus is not a female, right? It's not rocket science. But this is what, if you ask any theologian, uh, most theologians will tell you they think Jesus is who is being referred to in Proverbs 8 and 1 when it clearly states it's a female, okay? And you have to ask yourself, that doesn't even make any sense. Jesus is not a transgender. He's not a female. So why would they why would they say that? 